a couple years ago, I had published an article, and it was during the time of the New Zealand shootings, which was also a very difficult moment for the Muslim Ummah, and uh, terrible. And so many people were also glued to the news at that point because, unfortunately, there was footage of the entire carnage that happened. But also because many families had a hard time with how do you exactly talk to children about all of this. So the article at the time, which SubhanAllah, we've pulled it out so many times since that's a lot, that was 2019. Um, and the article's called the on prophetic wisdom and speaking to children in times of distress. And for those of you who are on the Zoom, I'm going to put this in the chat box for you. And for those of you who are on our WhatsApp group, I'm going to also put it for you there in case you'd like to reference it later. Um, I will start with that, inshallah, and then we have our experts here next to me who are going to um, talk both about Muslim children identity and also about how to cope and what to do and how to help, inshallah ta'ala. I think, though, you'll find that a lot of what's being referenced today actually applies to all of us here, too, not just our children, subhanAllah. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about this article and what I wanted to share with you. For me, when I think about how the Prophet wasallam talked to everybody around him, there was this beautiful prophetic way in which he spoke. And subhanAllah, our halakha was meant to be a description of the Prophet wasallam because we had started in Rabi'a al-Awwal before everything, the most recent events had happened. And we had to, of course, shift gears because this really is a time that requires intense dua and prayer. But back to the Prophet ﷺ, when you think about how it is that he spoke specifically to young people and especially to people in his family. You know, there are many people who are very, um, have, how do I say this and not get myself in trouble? They are known in their communities to be, oh, mashallah, 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 sisters or brothers. But at home, it's a completely different face and tone. <laughs> the Prophet وسلم, what you saw is what you got inside and out. And whether it was his own child or whether it was his any one of his family members or whether it was his closest companions and friends or whether it was the, the broader community, what you saw was what you got. And that's something very important and very special about him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we take example from him. We take from his sunnah, even in times of distress and difficulty. And um, another thing that I wanted to share about him is he spoke, when we talk about children, to their level. And I think that's really important today. And part of the conversation we're going to have a little bit with our therapist as well is, you know, he was very keen on um, making sure that the person in front of him understood what he was saying and that they were not overburdened unnecessarily. And this becomes really important about kind of age appropriate milestones. Here at the Rahma Foundation, those of you have girls in our halakas here, you'll know that one of the things that we really like pride ourselves on, inshallah ta'ala, I hope it's accurate and true, is that, and we've been doing this for years, is that the content that we teach in the different groups that you have your girls in, right, the frogs and bunnies and the rainbows and the busy bees and the rosebuds, right, that they're age appropriate content. That we're not talking to frogs and bunnies about very difficult things to understand. In fact, we're trying to break it down to their toddler level, right? The four and five and six-year-olds. And when we get all the way to your busy bees, your middle schoolers, now we start to get into kind of like some conversation and definitely by the high school, right? We're starting to get into heavy, heavy conversations. But it's age appropriate because what we find is that there are... Um, just like there are physical milestones, right? You know when your child starts walking and talking and eating, like there's different milestones that you look out for, right? And same thing, just like you have physical milestones, there's cognitive milestones. What could be understood when? Because children, subhanAllah, sometimes have um, a very concrete thinking. They don't understand a lot of nuance. So when you try to read, I'll give you an example. We tend to start to reach, uh, um, teach Quran from Juz Amma because the 30th part, right, is the small surahs. But it's also the surahs with a lot of heavy, heavy references and a lot of um, metaphorical references and also things related to heaven and hell, which are not metaphors, those are real. But it's hard for them to fully understand something they can't see directly in front of them. And there's reference to jinn and reference to angels and reference to other things that they can't, children can't quite see. 
So it's a time for a lot of confusion, actually. And so interestingly enough, a lot of our teachers say they may memorize them, but when you come to explanation, you're careful in what you say, because otherwise you might actually teach them something that is not appropriate age-wise right then and there for them, but they, they absolutely should, and we'll learn it, but a little bit later, right? Same concept here, same concept here. And so what I wanted to share with you, and I think um, Sister Wajma and Dr. Zahid are both gonna kind of pick up here from where I, I start with you. Whenever there is a really horrific tragedy that's unfolding, in this case, it's still unfolding in front of us, it's very likely that at some point, the young people around you are going to ask about this if they haven't already. And when they do, there is a decision to be made about what to say and when and to who. I would say this, I'm gonna go through part of what the article talks about and then Shelly, you'll get to reference it, but the most important thing that you can do is know that it starts with you. It starts with us, us the adults. It starts with us because it depends on how we're doing. Somebody shared with me that their young child said to them, why do you look so stressed out? And that the mom said, because there's all these difficult things happening. And the daughter said, then you shouldn't be reading the news, mama. So cute, that's a lot of call off. But also they pick up. It's amazing how much children pick up, that they understand, even if you don't say anything, when you are stressed out, they understand that something is off, right? And then they start picking up snippets of conversations. If not full on, you've taken them to a protest with you, so they've seen everything with you, subhanAllah. And every, every family's a little bit different. But it starts with us and how much we um, engage with our children and what's happening with us in real time. So if we're glued constantly to the phone and not engaging with them, there are a lot of questions that they're having and it's very confusing actually for them. So what do you do? Part of it is preparing, and this is why we're having this halakha today. Part of it is preparing as, as best as you can. It's not always perfect. And with the preparing, which is we're doing tonight, inshallah, the next step from that comes inquiring, actually asking them what they know or allowing them to come up to you and waiting for that. And this depends on their age. So let's kind of break this down a little bit. For those of you that have that frogs and bunny age group I was talking about, the three, four, five, six-year-olds, Avoid sharing anything unnecessarily with this age group. They're kind of in their la-la land. Right? And they need to stay there as best as much as we can. Um, and only if we suspect that they know something or they say that they know something because maybe they have an older sibling that has said something to them or maybe they have heard something that you've said. Um, so at that point, you can ask them what they've heard that's upsetting them and help them understand it a bit better, which I'm going to leave to uh, Sister Wajima to explain to us a bit more. When we get to the age group that's after that, so let's talk about your, like your seven to 12 year olds. This is where you wanna wait and see. Wait and see. If they come to you and wanna ask these questions, and I say this because every child is different. You even might have several children yourself, same parents, same household, but every child is different, subhanAllah. I have one child who's very in tune. Like I could be saying something in the other room. <laughs> I'm like, how did you even hear that? But, and I have another child who's totally aloof, la, 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 like totally aloof, right? And so, and I'm like, how did you not see that? Right, subhanAllah. And so same household, same family, <laughs> And so this is where you would wait and see if they ask us. And in this age group of seven to 12, if they don't actually come up and ask you or initiate the conversation, you may choose to just sort of let it be the way it is. Um, it could be that they are not fully plugged into what's going on, or it could be that they're not willing to yet fully tell you how heavy this is for them. And this is where, if it's not in words, because sometimes young children don't have words to explain, instead they show their distress in other ways. Well, how do they show their distress? Well, it could be um, forms of regression, where they're kind of going backwards, right? And uh, things that you're kind of like, what's going on here? Like, you, you, you know, you usually don't wake up in the middle of the night scared right? Or you usually are not scared to sleep with the lights off, you know, things, things like that where they're kind of going backwards from the milestones they've already um, uh, came up through. Um, and so you might want to ask them at that point, you know, kind of sit with them and figure out what is it that they have seen or heard or understood and then process that with them, which we'll talk about a little later. How do you process? 
your teenagers, this is where you just assume that they know. Of course they have to have known, right? In fact, if you've given them one of these things, <laughs> they absolutely have known and seen and may be very active, maybe even more than you expect, <laughs> mashallah. And it's really important that even at that point that you help fill in the blanks because there could be confusion and there could be also questions or there could be bullying that's been happening or harassment of different sorts. And if they're not fully opening up to you, um, you don't expect at this stage that they'll come up and say anything. It might require you to ask and kind of pull as much as you're able to. And I also like to make sure that we do touch on anybody who has um, children with disabilities. I think this is important too, to touch base on. When you, um, this is where it really depends on what level of ability they have and their comprehension and level of understanding. And it may not match necessarily physical age, as you can imagine. And so you will know your child best. Nobody knows them better than you do. But I think it's also important that we don't just assume that they don't necessarily know what's happening or tapped in. So I just want to make sure that you are um, kind of aware of some of these, the breakdown of some of this. And I'll just share two more things before I hand this over. The importance of listening and the importance of validating. The listening becomes really important because so often as parents, we do this thing called problem solving. <laughs> we go immediately into problem solving mode. You know, who said that to you? What did they do? <laughs> like immediately. When actually, and while you may need to take some steps to rectify what's happened, the reality is you need to kind of like, <laughs> kind of pull the reins just a little bit and just hear them out. Because maybe it's something that they've dealt with or maybe they don't want you to deal with or whatever it may be, but what they really want from you is to be heard, right? To be seen, to be heard. And the validating has a lot to do with whatever their emotions are including your own, by the way, validating your own emotions. I've heard so many people in this week, this past week say, um, I feel so terrible, but that doesn't matter because what's happening to my sisters and brothers is beyond worse than what's going on to me. My response to that is, your emotions are what Allah gave you and your reality is what Allah gave you and their reality is what Allah gave them and it is very difficult to witness. The reality is though, Allah didn't ask you to erase your emotions. Does that make sense? Allah's put us in a place where we have the running water and the electricity and the safety and the prosperity and all the rest of it. And there are sisters and brothers across the ummah that don't have any of the above. And it's hard. Allah knows what he's doing and knows where he put each person and will ask each person accordingly. And that's probably what scares me the most, <laughs> more than whether we have big emotions or small emotions. What worries me the most is having all of this and then being asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because those who are in those situations, the really horrific things that we're seeing, they're not going to have the kind of hisab we're going to have. Do you know what I'm trying to say here? And that's where we ask ourselves, what can we do? What should we be doing? Which will be part of our conversations, inshallah ta'ala. But I just wanted to say to validate. Don't, don't shut down your emotions or their emotions, whatever they may be, even if you don't fully agree with them.